uh, try to save time to podium. I'm half Italian, which means that I can't stand still and talk at the same time. Uh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, and I want to thank you very, very much. I want to particularly thank uh, Janet and Mark uh, Rosenberry, uh, who were just a constant host here. So nice, even though coming from the East Coast, we're not used to people being this nice. Uh, we just assume you're serial killers when you're that nice. <laughs> It's amazing to hear what all of these, uh, would be even a small number of the people in this room uh, have done for the public interest. I was actually thinking, you know, uh, Ed Beck talks about the liberal cabal, and I was going to go try to find a phone and say, I found them. <laughs> um, they're here in Des Moines, get here as fast as you can. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is a great honor to just speak with people uh, who have done so much uh, against uh, such great odds and with so little. Uh, and those of us who are working in different parts of the country uh, all rely on each other uh, for the work that we're doing. And the victories here in Iowa resonate elsewhere. And we appreciate everything this organization did. 75 years is an amazing accomplishment uh, for this organization. I was, I was, um, I was thinking here to talk about of the United States Supreme Court, which after all is just going into session. But I was asked to talk also uh, to, to make a few comments about the Iowa retention issue. And indeed, that issue is well known to people on the uh, East Coast. Uh, it's an incredibly important issue. Uh, the, uh, you know, we saw a fantastic victory for civil liberties in the state uh, with the ruling of the Iowa Supreme Court. And it made this state the front line, the, the vanguard of that fight. And to see the effort to strip the court of uh, uh, these powerful voices of civil liberties is a danger to us all, not just to Iowans. Now, you know, to me, when I was thinking, when I first read about the Iowa retention fight, I was actually thinking of Federalist 78. I'm not sort of a Madisonian uh, scholar, but uh, occasionally, Alexander Hamilton got it right. <laughs> and something that he said in, in, in number 78 uh, seems to have been written for the battle that is going on right now in terms of retention of these justices. And uh, I'm going to quote what he said in a couple of parts. But one is, he tried to explain why it is that we have an independent judiciary and why it's so central to the scheme that he helped design uh, and how people like James Madison struggled to realize. He said this independence of judges is equally requisite to guard the Constitution and the rights of individuals from the effects of those of ill humor, which uh, the arts of designing men or the influence of particular conjunctures sometimes disseminate among the people themselves. And Hamilton went on to say, it is not with a view to infractions of the Constitution only that the independence of judges may be essential to safeguard against the effects of occasional ill humors in society. These sometimes descend no farther than the injury of private rights of particular classes of citizens. And he ended that passage by saying, Consider of men of every description ought to prize what will tend to begin to fortify the temper in the courts, as no man can be sure that he may not be tomorrow the victim of the spirit of injustice. That is what your fight is about in the retention of these justices. You are in a period of ill humor, to put it lightly. But an issue is not the future of these jurists. It issues the future of citizens' life and to preserve this shining beacon of an opinion that came out of the state. Now, what's fascinating about the retention of Iowa in Iowa is that we're having uh, a, a really an amazing period of reevaluation of the role of judges and courts in our society. In various states, we're facing 
difficult questions about the role of judges and what protections they should be afforded, but also in other states, how we can control judges who engage in abuse, including abuse of individuals. We also have the Capitan decision of West Virginia involving the dangers of the funding of judicial elections. And in that case, a very powerful mining company uh, trying to buy and succeed to some extent uh, in the Supreme Court of that state. The, the fact is I am not a, a fan for judicial elections. Uh, yeah, I, I find it very problematic. Iowa is one of the best systems uh, in the country. Uh, I, but I have to say, election of state judges still run against the grain, but uh, this is a system uh, that is head and shoulders above uh, the vast majority of states. But we're seeing a, a change in judges, and part of that may be to, to bit blame on people like uh, me, Les Robert, I suppose I don't want to throw him in the mix, but because of the 24-hour media cycle, uh, it is having an effect on judges. Uh, many of them want to be Judge Judy, God help us. Uh, and they engage in uh, increasingly outrageous abuses. Uh, and that corrosive effect on judges is being seen by lawyers around the country. And part of it is also expressed in the Supreme Court itself, that judges are increasingly desirous of being celebrities. And that has a corrosive effect. I, I preferred the period on the Supreme Court when no one knew who a judge was or a justice. There was a time once when a family outside the Supreme Court uh, was posing for a picture, and they called over this old guy and asked him to take a picture of, uh, of the family. And he blew it, and they said, can you do it again? And, and uh, he stood there, and he took two more pictures, and, and then walked away, and the guard came up and said, how did you get Justice White to take a picture? <laughs> I, that actually was a better period, uh, in my view, when justices allowed their opinions to speak for themselves. And this is a criticism of both liberals and conservatives on the court. I think that it is a mistake to see justices going out and speaking in highly political environments, uh, throwing meat uh, to respective crowds, uh, and I think it undermines the institution. But it is obviously the trend. That's one of the reasons I regretted uh, John Paul Stevens leaving uh, the uh, Supreme Court. I adored Stevens. Uh, and not just because he was a Cubs fan. Uh, and you'll note what happened to a White Sox fan for civil liberties when they get into the White House. Cubs fan, fight torture. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you, I, I, I loved Justice Stevens, uh, just not just as a person, but as a jurist, uh, because he didn't want celebrity status. Uh, we, had a, we both gave a speech to judges in Milwaukee a few years ago, and we took the plane together. And at one point, I'm not saying this out of self aggrandizement but it sort of reflects uh, the way Stevens lived his life, is a lawyer came up, and I was standing there with Stevens, and and said, you know, I'm one of your greatest fans, and shook my hand, and, and it was going on about how we liked uh, uh, something or other, and I said, can I introduce you to Justice Stevens? Uh, and he sort of turned beet red and sort of ran from, from the area. <laughs> but, you know, we got on that plane, so much actually hit Stevens in the head with, the, with her luggage. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, this is a wonderful thing. This is what, uh, not that he's in that. This is a wonderful thing. This guy can get on an airplane, no one recognizes him, despite, despite the, the fact that very few people on earth has affected their lives as much as John Paul Stevens. Uh, and I, by the way, take credit for his career. Uh, uh, indeed, for the Planned Parenthood representatives, I take credit for Roe v. Wade. Uh, I was in Milwaukee, actually, right? before my speech, we were in this wonderful hotel. It's called Mike Fiffer, Mike Seriously, really beautiful hotel, very old in Milwaukee. And but they had these old elevators and these big marble staircases. And, and I was coming out of um, one elevator, and Stevens was standing there looking for his wife right at the edge of the, this long marble staircase. And out came this, this guy from the hotel, this 
pulling one of those luggage things and pushing another one. And it didn't see Stevens, it was pushing it straight at Stevens, who was like perched on the side of this, uh, this uh, staircase. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> And I sort of grabbed him and pulled him back. And this was quite a, a moment for all of us. And, and when we finally collected ourselves, I said, you know, Mr. Justice, the sad thing is, you're not going to tell anybody that I just saved Ruby Wayne. Are you? <laughs> And he said, no, no. <laughs> so I am every dinner and have to say this, because no one else is. Uh, but the, uh, I want to talk about the Supreme Court, uh, not just because it has played such a, a role for all of us uh, in what we do. It is the final call uh, for civil liberties. That's not always the answer to that call. Uh, but in my view, uh, the United States Supreme Court is a deeply flawed institution. And uh, I have a proposal in Congress. It's been there for years. Um, uh, it's actually one of three proposals to reform the Supreme Court. And uh, that is to increase the size of the Supreme Court to 19 members. And the reason is I believe the United States Supreme Court is demonstrably too small. And is, in fact, dysfunctional because of the size. Now, to understand why you've got to sort of understand a bit about the Supreme Court, because when I say that to the civil libertarians, it almost seems heretical. Because the fact is that when every court closes the door to us, occasionally the Supreme Court steps forward. And in moments like Brown v. Board of Education. And we often have to try to remind ourselves that when they do a particularly horrible job on other things uh, of late, mm -hmm. uh, that they have occasionally answered that call for us. And so nobody wants to change this institution. It is revered uh, so much. But the fact is, the United States Supreme Court has been deeply flawed uh, as an institution. And it doesn't have the ability to reform itself. In fact, justices serve uh, almost without the possibility of removal. You have to remove them through impeachment. Uh, I, I, I would say impeachment is difficult, but I represent uh, Judge Porteous, and uh, this current group of senators seems to be making it uh, all too easy. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was the weirdest trial of my life, I will tell you that. And, um, uh, it, hasn't, it, hasn't, it hasn't concluded yet. We still have closing arguments to make in front of these hundred senators. Uh, but uh, the view of how the senators view the rules of evidence at trial is. Uh, Anthropological. <laughs> um, so the Supreme Court actually did not start with that. First of all, it started with six members. Only two showed up in New York. Uh, but the justices that were selected have always been problematic. In fact, uh, John Rutledge was one of the first justices appointed by uh, President uh, Washington in 1795. And even when he was appointed, there were accounts of his called mad frolics. Uh, and uh, one person, one South Carolina senator said, Rutledge is frequently so much in the range as to be a great measure deprived of his senses. That was before he took office. Uh, and he was accompanied later by Henry Baldwin, who was described by uh, Daniel Webster as being entirely insane. Uh, and an example of the curable lunacy. Uh, and that was followed by Robert Greer, who was described by uh, an academic at the time of scarcely able to function. 